Um, our principal issues are some of the kind of classic uh, civil liberties issues like privacy and free speech. And uh, also a lot of the, well, the funds then that, you, that you give us and that our donors give us uh, go to litigation on these issues. So we're about half lawyers fighting in the courts uh, to protect your rights. We're also, we have some staff technologists who work out what, what these new technologies do, what they, how they affect our freedoms. And then there are people like me who do some communications work and also help uh, channel the voices of ordinary individuals to policymakers, to legislators, to Congress to make sure that ordinary people are heard in major policy debates. So we take on those issues with uh, privacy and free speech. Also, electronic voting uh, will be there on the front lines in the November election, as we've been for the last four years or so. Uh, and also, we deal with innovation policy and fair use. Um, many of you may be familiar with some of our major issues because they have to do with digital copyright. And of course, Google itself is at the center of major, the, many of the major digital copyright issues today. Um, well, that's certainly true. It's important to realize that the issues Google is facing now with respect to copyright aren't exactly novel. Right? They're an evolution of an ongoing battle that we've been having over these issues for eight or 10 years or more about how we properly strike the balance between the rights of copyright holders uh, to have enough encouragement to produce their works and the rights of the public, the rights of follow-on artists, the rights of educators, the rights of citizens, the rights of innovators to reuse those works, to create new technologies that reuse those works, and, and how we properly strike the balance between those two goals. Um, and I want to make it clear that, that Google is part of this evolution of this battle, because it really helps set the context for what Gwen is about to tell you about. Gwen is going to tell you about a new IP-like regime for broadcast, cablecast, netcasting um, that's being discussed in a far-off policy body in Geneva. right? The decisions made there will affect the internet, will affect Google, will affect you in three years, five years, 10 years. They may have grave consequences for the internet, for Google, for you. Um, so to think about how this copyright evolution has, has affected Google, um, to put one case into, into focus, there's a case of, by Perfect 10 against Google right now that's now on appeal. In that case, Perfect 10 adult magazine publisher sued Google for linking to images that may be infringing, and for its image search that shows thumbnails right, of these potentially infringing images. Interestingly enough, Perfect Ten's arguments mirror, in many ways, the arguments of Hollywood and the major record labels in their cases against file sharing companies. Right? Uh, and for that reason, the Motion Picture Association and record labels have lined up in support of Perfect Ten in this case. Right? EFF has been involved in uh, file sharing issues for many years, and we took the Grokster case about file sharing uh, networks to the Supreme Court. Uh, on the most narrow terms, that case dealt with whether people could create multi-purpose file sharing networks and distribute software to the public. More broadly, it dealt with the issue of all innovators, whether they could create new, exciting, multi-purpose technologies without begging permission. Right? Again, Google didn't have to beg permission from Hollywood in order to create its search engine. Right? They could come up with the algorithm, implement it, put the website up. That was it. Right? That sort of wide berth for innovation is critical to get new exciting technologies like the ones that are created here. Um, while the Supreme Court's uh, decision in Grokster was flawed in many ways, it did hold intact one of the, the most important standards that protects innovators. And, and we're very happy that, that the court left that intact. Uh, EFF was also involved in a case called uh, Kelly versus Arebasoft which dealt with one of the early image search engines and uh, said that the search engine basically by making the thumbnails was making a fair use of the copyright works, a legal use even though they didn't have permission from the copyright owners. That precedent is of course important in the Perfect 10 case. It's also critical when it comes to Google book search. Right? The analogy being that an excerpt from a book, a small snippet, similar to a thumbnail of an image. Um, so it's these sort of this evolution of the digital copyright fight that's now coming to a head uh, with Google. So with that in mind, it's important that, that we turn to the broadcasting treaty. We nip whatever problems that there might be in the butt before they come back to haunt innovators 10 years on, as many innovators have been haunted by the problems with transitioning copyright into the digital age. And with that said, I'll turn things over to Gwen to uh, talk about the broadcasting treaty. I also 
want to thank you and thank the kind folk at Google for the opportunity to talk with you today. This is actually a very timely uh, time for doing this presentation. This week in the marble walls of uh, marble halls of Geneva, the World Intellectual Properties 182 members are going to vote about whether to convene a diplomatic conference, an intergovernmental conference, on adopting this controversial new broadcasting treaty that I'm about to tell you about. My goal today is to give you a sense about why FF is concerned about this. We've been working in opposition to this treaty for three years because of our concerns. And my goal is to try to give you a sense about why you at Google should also be concerned about this and what you can do. Well, let's start off by looking at what the treaty would do. The treaty is above and beyond copyright, as Daphne put it. The treaty would create a broad new set of rights that apply in addition to and over the top of copyright. Broadcasters and cablecasters, the treaty covers both broadcasters and cablecasters, would get new rights, a right to control the recording or the fixation of their transmissions, a right to control or authorise who can do simultaneous retransmissions of broadcasts and cablecasts over the internet, and broad new 50-year rights that apply to recorded content. So rights that would include making available, transmission of recorded copies, uh, distribution and public communication of recorded content, both over the internet and over traditional broadcast and cablecast channels. Most importantly, the treaty includes a requirement for countries that sign on to provide legal protection to technological protection measures that are used by broadcasters and cablecasters. Many of the folk here, I'm sure, are familiar with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that Daphne mentioned. So what we're looking at here is an additional set of rights that apply over the top of copyright and a new type of DRM regime, digital rights management regime, backed up by law. The treaty would, in effect, allow broadcasters and cablecasters to use these broad new rights backed up by the legally enforced technological protection measures to restrict access to material that's transmitted, even if the use of that material would be permitted under national copyright law, if the material is Creative Commons licensed, for instance, or if copyright didn't apply, for instance, where a work might be in the public domain and therefore not subject to copyright at all. This is obviously a concern to those of us who believe that access to information is what gives us a foundation for technological innovation and what's necessary for social and economic development. I want to pause here and, and just note one important thing. My last bullet point here. At the moment, US broadcasters do not have intellectual property rights in their broadcasts and cablecasters likewise. So the treaty would actually be quite a radical change for those of us in the United States. The reason that US broadcasters don't have intellectual property rights over broadcasts is because the US has never signed on to the 1961 Rome Convention, which is the existing international instrument that grants broadcasters 20-year rights in countries that have signed on to that treaty. The US isn't a party to that. So instead, in the United States, broadcasts are protected by a mixture of copyright in the underlying content, some Federal Communications Act provisions, and at the state level there are various um, criminal laws that deal with theft of services, so theft of paid programming. Um, there's also some provisions that specifically deal with uh, decryption devices for devices that use, um, that receive encrypted content. Webcasting. This is why you should care about this treaty. You may not care about broadcasting and cablecasting, but the treaty may well cover webcasting. In 2002, the United States made a proposal to extend the treaty to webcasters. There are various webcasting companies in the United States, Yahoo, News Corp, and the Digital Media Association, their industry body, who have asked for these rights in the treaty to be granted to webcasters. And their main argument for wanting these rights is, is one of parity. They believe that broadcasters and webcasters should get equivalent rights because they're often transmitting the same type of content even if the platform is different. And for that reason, the United States put forward a proposal in 2002 and then again in 2003 to include webcasting. And that's been in the treaty up until the last draft. That has been extremely controversial. 
in 2004 and 2005, most of the other member countries at WIPO have rejected extension of the treaty to the internet. And webcasting was the main point of contention. Negotiations actually almost came to a stop earlier this year because of this very issue. And so as a compromise, as a way forward, in May 2006, WIPO agreed to take webcasting out of the current treaty and split the treaty in two. So what we currently have is a treaty that theoretically deals with broadcasting and cable casting in the traditional sense. And we're dealing with that at the moment. That's on a fast track. And we separately have a new second instrument that will deal with internet transmissions. Um, and specifically with webcasting. The goal is to have that be a separate instrument that will be part of discussions in November. But it didn't actually work out that way. The nice, clear and simple divide is not actually what we have in practice. The current draft of the treaty actually doesn't include webcasting, but what it does do, as I mentioned, is give broadcasters and cablecasters exclusive right of control over simultaneous and deferred transmissions of their content over the internet. So the internet is still part and parcel of, of the current treaty draft. The story does not end there. The US in August produced a new proposal to extend the treaty to a subset of webcasters called netcasters. That will either, depending on how the vote goes this week in Geneva, that will either be part of the current treaty that is on the table, or else, as I said, it will be part of a new treaty, so we'll have a new conversation about a new treaty that will look probably quite a bit like this treaty that would deal with netcasting. The key question you're probably asking is, what does netcasting look like? <sighs> this is stuff that makes a copyright lawyer's heart warm. This slide goes for, for two, th this definition, which is the definition of the proposed extension, goes for two slides. I'm going to let the words speak for themselves because if I read that out, you'd all go to sleep. Right, so have you all got that? Great, great. <laughs> As I said, it's truly loyally dream stuff. I, I guess the sort of the simple takeaway from that is it's an amalgam of various things. It looks like IPTV mixed with some simulcasting, and it has to be done by a legal entity, whatever that means. But that's not currently in the treaty. As I said, that's on the table, lurking in the background. We're waiting to see what happens. The treaty does include internet transmissions, but potentially could also include these. So what's so bad about the treaty? Why is EFF concerned? Well, the ostensible reason why we're going through this process of negotiating a treaty is signal protection. There's a concern that broadcasters invest money, and cablecasters as well, and in order to protect the, um, the signal that they've invested money into, we should have a treaty. I think many people agree that that's a laudable aim. There's a general consensus amongst all the people who are following the treaty that signal protection is a worthy goal. The problem is the current treaty draft goes beyond signal protection and creates new intellectual property rights, 50-year intellectual property rights, over broadcasts and cable casts and potentially over netcasts. And those broad new rights, backed by, as I mentioned, legally enforced technological protection measures, can do or could do four things. First, they could create potential liability for internet intermediaries. They certainly will stifle technological innovation, which is one of the reasons why EFF cares. They will restrict access to knowledge and freedom of speech online in the online communities. And they're likely to threaten consumers' existing time shifting and in-home or personal networking retransmission rights in the United States, which is something that's currently lawful under US copyright law. Technological protection measure. Thank you for the clarification. Well, we think this will be bad for the entire internet, but to make this a little bit more concrete and to explain why, we'd like to give you a sense about how this treaty might apply to Google's mission to organise the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And we thought what we would try to do here is highlight how some of Google's current products and some of the products that we think might be likely to be developed, how they might be implicated by the new rights that this treaty would create. You guys know Google way better than I do, so I know the broadcasting treaty. What I have chosen to do is uh, chosen these three areas, and I'd be happy to 
talk further about other Google products that might be on the line in the question session after we finish. So let's look at Google search engines. Let's consider Google's video search, the current video search, and a new product that would be a, an index created by Google of the world's audio and TV broadcast content. There are already entities that are out there archiving radio and television broadcasts. Google might well want to create an index that actually provides user functionality to finding content in that archive. That technology relies on access to recorded content without seeking prior explicit per, uh, permission. How would the broadcasting treaty implicate that? Well, the broadcasting treaty will change that environment for two reasons. First, it will require permission for copying, for indexing, and for displaying search results and linking to search results. Secondly, what we can see straight up front is that the technological protection measures, if they're used on broadcast or cablecast content, might prevent some material even being part of an archive or even being indexed and therefore being part of the, the search results that you see. So you might see parts of the world's uh, audio and television broadcast archive being blocked out of the Google search. How does copyright deal with this? Well, I wanted to highlight here that, that we have a sense about how this goes in the copyright world, particularly as regards to search engines. But what I also want to highlight here is what is novel about these rights. As I mentioned, these rights don't exist in the United States. Broadcasters do not have intellectual property rights in their broadcasts and cablecasts. And this treaty is not a copyright treaty. This treaty is a new, would create a new and completely unknown set of rights. In copyright, we've got 100 plus years of history. We know what the boundaries are. We know what sort of secondary liability, what indirect liability for a copyright might look like. We have no idea whether there will be secondary liability and what it will look like in relation to these rights, in relation to the direct rights that, that a company might violate. Again, we have no clear boundaries about what the scope of these rights will be. So while I'm highlighting the, the way that copyright has dealt with these things, or imperfectly dealt with these things in the case of the Perfect 10 case, I just want to highlight that much of what we're dealing with here is the unknown, and that's exactly why many people are concerned about this treaty and its implications. But to look at the basics, a search, if we're talking about creating an index in a search, we're talking about reproduction, um, in potentially reproduction in relation to caching, and we're talking about display rights, arguably distribution rights. So there might be questions about whether Google would have uh, a dir would directly violate copyright owners' rights. We've seen that being the subject of litigation in Parker v. Google and Field v. Google and Perfect 10 v. Google. I'm sure many of the folk who work on these cases in the chapter and verse exactly how these issues work. So I'm going to greatly oversimplify here and just say there are a number of potential points here where Google might find if it were to create a broadcast index or an index of broadcast and audio cast works, it might find that there's some question about liability. There may be issues about reproduction. As I mentioned, the treaty uh, precludes uh, any reproduction of recorded content without prior permission from broadcasters and cablecasters. It also gives broadcasters and cablecasters exclusive control over making available or transmission or communication of recorded content. So anything that looks like a display by producing a, a search result, again, might involve either primary or, um, or secondary, copy, secondary broadcast treaty liability for, for Google. The point I want to highlight here is this. In the copyright cases that Google's been involved in so far, Google has largely, with some exceptions relating to fair use and thumbnails in, in relation to Google image search, Google has benefited from the exceptions and limitations in US copyright law. That has allowed Google to release to the market fantastic, innovative products that benefit all society. It has, in fact, benefited from fair use, something that's well understood in the United States. It's benefited from a series of statutory safe harbors for internet service providers who cache, host, and who uh, provide location information tools. And it's also benefited from a fairly well-defined and understood set of principles about secondary liability for copyright. 
What's different in relation to the Broadcasting Treaty is that none of that is guaranteed. There's no guarantee that there will be any equivalent or mirror set of exceptions and limitations to these new broadcasting rights. And that should be a source of major concern. It's for exactly that reason that internet service providers such as AT&T, Verizon, and US Telecom have weighed in in opposition to this treaty because it creates potential liability for any internet intermediary, not just Google, but any internet service provider who, for instance, transmits content and authorized recordings across a network might find that it has potential liability under this treaty with no guarantee that there will be internet intermediary exceptions that parallel those that we currently rely on in copyright law. The treaty actually allows countries who sign onto the treaty to create mirror exceptions, but it doesn't require it. So what that means in practical terms is that you have a domestic battle when it comes down to implementing this treaty in US law. And that looks like the will of your relevant national government versus the strength of your domestic lobbying enterprises on behalf of the, the broadcasters who are seeking these rights. And what I fear is that we'll see a battle at the US congressional level to protect every single exceptional limitation in copyright law that we rely on repeated at the broadcasting treaty level. Let's look at another part of the Google Video service. Google, is, Google Video is also a hosting enterprise. Users can upload content to the Google Video website. And the question that Google might be asking itself here, well, there are two questions. One is, will Google get the benefit of this treaty? Is it possible that Google will suddenly find itself in a situation where Google gets 50-year rights over everything that it, its users upload to Google Video? Will it suddenly get the, the absolute exclusive rights of control over internet redistribution of Google video content? That comes down to will Google be considered a netcaster for the purposes of that long definition I put up several slides back? I think the answer to that is likely not. And that's because if you went back and looked at the, the wording there, the concept that is clearly envisaged by the, the netcasting provision is IPTV in the sense that um, that the person who's doing the transmission controls the timing of the information being pushed out to consumers and that the content is received near simultaneously. Obviously, in relation to Google Video, that doesn't apply. The end user who's watching a Google Video will be the one who pulls the content. So the second question Google might have is, will there be any potential liability for hosting material that might be infringing? Obviously, if Google were to get direct licensing from broadcasting and cable casting networks for their content, that wouldn't be an issue. But because the treaty gives broadcasters and cable casters the exclusive right over recording broadcast or cable cast content, it's possible that Google could find itself in a situation where an end user posts to Google Video something that is an unauthorized recording of content. Well, what does that mean? In the copyright context, we know what that looks like. We've got a well understood, somewhat imperfect mechanism for dealing with that. We have this provision, a notice and takedown uh, procedure that is one of the statutory safe harbors in the Copyright Act in section 512, and it's straightforward. It doesn't always work perfectly, but if someone who is hosting material receives a letter, a notice and takedown request from someone who alleges that material being hosted is copyright infringing, if the, the hoster takes down the material, then notifies the original poster that they've done so, they've got limited liability for copyright infringement. Again, my point here is there will be no equivalent regime for broadcasting content. You cannot assume that the same type of mirror exceptions or the same type of safe harbors will be created in relation to this new set of rights. Finally, I, I wanted to sort of touch on a, another area where Google has an important mission in making content available, and it does it through new technology. I wanted to look at two things. One is a new version of Google News that actually looks at broadcast and, and cablecast content, and mention Google Books here. The Google Book Search project, both its partner program and the library project, are, are important in this regard. 
Each of those projects would require or requires access to content without prior permission, even if it's with compensation, as in the case of um, Google's payments to Associated Press for its news feeds for Google News. Um, and it's not clear exactly what the Broadcasting Treaty will do in this regard, other than to give you some sort of broad brush stroke answers. Obviously, there's a concern, or there might be a concern, that there will be additional licensing costs to pay here, parallel to those that apply in relation to Associated Press and Google News Feeds. The second and perhaps more important point is to notice how the treaty impacts technological innovation. So the creation of new devices that Google, new devices and new technologies that Google might create in order to make content available to the world citizens is what's at risk here. I'm going to pause and just note in relation to this whole suite of issues, in the copyright context, again, we have really defined and clear-cut principles in US law that give us bellwethers, that give us markers so that we know roughly when we're doing technological innovation where the lines are and, and where we're safe to move. There's obviously fair use and implied license. There's reverse engineering that is protected as a form of either unprotected speech or fair use in, in United States law. All of these things are well understood mechanisms, but they won't apply again in the broadcast treaty context. So I, I just want to touch on specifically why AFF is concerned about technological innovation and hopefully speak to your hearts here about why we think you folks should also be concerned about this treaty. We think that the combination of the technological protection measures legally enforced technological protection measures with broad 50-year post-recording rights is going to have four potential consequences. First, at the sort of the very top level, the development of any new technology that interoperates with broadcast or cablecast or potentially netcast content is going to have to do an additional set of rights clearances. There'll be copyright potentially and also transmitter clearance. Secondly, as I mentioned, there's a possibility that the treaty would create new potential secondary liability for software developers and technology makers, device manufacturers, who create goods, products that end users might use to infringe these new rights of broadcasters, cablecasters, and potentially netcasters. That's going to chill innovation. Many companies are currently worried about this particular point. Third and most important from EFS point of view is the fact that the treaty includes legally enforced technological protection measures. That in combination with the broad post-recording 50-year rights that I mentioned will allow broadcasters and cablecasters and again potentially netcasters to control the market in devices that will receive that content. So what we're talking about there is set-top boxes, DVRs, and if we talk about netcasts, personal computers. What that might look like is precluding the development of the next TiVo or the next Slingbox. Finally, our experience in the United States has led us to conclude that the broadcaster technological protection measures that are envisaged by the treaty might require technology mandate laws in order to be implemented as part of national law. I'm sure many of the folk in the room are familiar with the broadcast flag uh, regulation from the FCC that's currently stalled and has been the subject of many uh, legislative attempts to, to reinsert it. Let me just say this, uh, since I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the technology issues, technology mandates are not good for innovation. They increase design costs, they reduce feature sets, and they are likely to reduce market competition in devices. For consumers also, they're bad news. Consumers usually bear the, the brunt of the increased costs, and more importantly, a broad technology mandate law, like the one that we expect would need to be put in place to implement the rights that are part of the treaty, could potentially override consumers' existing time-shifting rights under US copyright law, and their ability to retransmit or use material that's been lawfully acquired inside the home or their personal network. OK, so I've talked a lot about Google. My goal in doing so is to try to let you see the sort of the range of issues that EFF is concerned about here. As I said, this treaty is bad for the internet community as a whole, not just Google. But if it's bad for Google, it's bad for the internet. 
what we're talking about is changing the current internet world, a world which is based on permission, permission-free internet exchanges, and replacing it with a transmission right. Remember, broadcasters don't have to have created comment, content. Purely transmission right is what we're talking about here. And if that's backed by legally enforced technological protection measures, as I've said, we're concerned that that will have a, a grave impact both on, both on the device design market, but also on people's free speech and uh, communication rights. For other companies, other web, uh, internet companies, other web portals, other internet intermediaries, we think the liability issues are, are somewhat similar to the things we've talked about in relation to some of Google's products. I also just want to emphasize this last point here, that the treaty is bad for the entire internet community, not just internet companies. Podcasters, the user-generated content that is part of YouTube and is part of the rich media experience of MySpace, all of that is, is put at risk here by this treaty. And last week, and again yesterday, EFF delivered a letter to WIPO that's signed by 200 podcasters and podcasting organizations representing collectively thousands of podcasters around the world, that voices their concerns about this treaty. They've got two particular concerns, one in relation to their freedom of expression. They believe that the ability to get rights clearance for the material they want to use in their podcasts, they already face significant hurdles due to, unlicensed, uh, due to undeveloped licensing markets. If you add another layer of rights above and beyond copyright over the top of that, that's just going to make one more barrier make it a little bit more insurmountable for podcasters to use licensed, clear content. The second reason they're concerned, as I've mentioned, is the impact this treaty will have on technological innovation and the environment that allowed the creation of such things as iPods and web syndication technologies like RSS that make podcasting possible. This is a major concern to many people in the free speech community online. So, next question, what stage is the treaty at? Well, as we speak, discussions are underway in Geneva. Um, the WIPO General Assembly is meeting this week and it has the task of voting on whether to hold a diplomatic conference next July. There's been a recommendation from the, the Copyright Committee part of WIPO that there should, in fact, be this conference. The WIPO General Assembly, the plenary body of WIPO, has to make that decision this week. If they decide to convene that conference, the goal would be to have the treaty adopted then in July. They could vote otherwise, but unfortunately it's just not clear at this stage which way this is going to go. If a treaty is adopted in United States law, treaties aren't self-executing, so then what we would need to see is US implementation legislation that would make the treaty part of US law. And as I mentioned, what we see at EFF is that will be a battle for trying to develop balanced exceptions and limitations that provide enough room for technological innovation to go ahead, a battle that may well be hard fought and difficult to predict. I'm going to hand it over to Derek now to tell you what you can do to support EFF's efforts in this area. Good. So to wrap things up and tie it together, I mean, I think as Gwen meant, what, what happens to be bad for the internet in this case is bad for, for Google. I'm sure there are some things that are bad for Google that are good for the internet. But in this case, what's bad for the, what's bad for the internet is, is bad for Google, and I hope we've instilled a lot of fear in you. Um, uh, it, sometimes we hear people say, well, we're just fear-mongering. But what we're doing is just speculating here about, about a treaty that could go either way. Well, let me ask you who's really speculating here, right? Because right now, okay, we, have a, we have a world where to use broadcast content in all sorts of legal ways, you don't have to go ask permission first. Google could make a lot of new services that would be really innovative, and so could other innovators. Um, on the other hand, under this treaty, we have a world where the first line in your business model is not create a cool new product. It's ask broadcasters permission to create a cool new product. Right? Who's going to fund that? What VC wants to fund that? Well, you have to ask permission first. Uh, I think you're going to have a lot less takers. Now, OK, so we're not speculating. What about the broadcasters, right? Is there a lack of broadcast, cablecast, and webcast content that you have access to? Right? Do these people need more incentives to distribute works in these ways? No, there's tons of broadcast, cablecast content. Sure, there, you can have things about theft of service and signal piracy, people not getting cable that they haven't paid for, not getting HBO if they haven't paid for it. 
Sure. That's a whole different thing than what this treaty is about. As Gwen has explained, we're talking about a broad regime of new rights and new technical restrictions on use of your TiVo, all sorts of things. Okay? And what the broadcasters happen to have, of course, is a lot of money, a lot of power because of a lot of money. Um, and it's tough to fight against that a lot of the time. Um, it's expensive enough to fly to Geneva, right, as Gwen has to do over and over again, to wrangle with these people in far off bodies, policy bodies. Um, so there are a couple of things that we would, of course, love you to do, um, if not Google to do, certainly you as individuals. One, you can go to our website, action.eff.org, and take action now to tell your representatives to oppose this treaty. Second thing you can do is support EFF. As I said, we, we are a small organization. We have 25 people, small budget. We find a lot of tough cases on a lot of different issues. Uh, litigation is hard. Flying to Geneva is hard, and it's expensive. Um, so as I said, we have on the table over there brochures uh, and little donation envelopes. You can also go to our website, sign up, become a member, get a hat, get a t-shirt, um, get an LED keychain. Good stuff, right? Um, and you'll be supporting a good cause. So I think those are those three things. Those that spread the word about the treaty too. But mainly, if you can go to our action center now and then uh, and support EFF, uh, we'd be quite pleased. So thanks very much for your time. And I would add to that that Google will match donations to EFF. Um, I've heard rumors of uh, whoever does the donation matching digging in their heels and trying not to match. If, if they do that, email me or email AMAC and we'll straighten it out. Because um, EFF is doing great work. Uh, I'll say that personally. <laughs> this isn't Google urging you to donate to EFF. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people have questions, so let's open up the floor. Yeah, go ahead. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you all are, are a great organization, and, and the work that you do you know, is not duplicated in a lot of other places. Uh, so you know, please take my comments in, in, in that light, because I, as a friend, I, I want to push you a little bit on one or maybe two issues. It, it, it jars me when you talk about the creation of new rights for uh, people like broadcasters. I was thinking about it while you were talking, and uh, there are other words that I think are more suitable here. I mean, you know, simple words like powers, because when you, you know, when you talk about rights, you're, you're talking about something that this country was built on, right? And a, a key part of the Constitution is the Bill of Rights, and in there, it's really about the rights of actual human beings and limiting the powers of government, right? right? The right of the people peaceably to assemble and, and petition the government for redress of grievances. Right? That's a right that limits government power. And I feel like it just kind of hits me every time you talk about giving broadcasters new rights, where I, where I feel like what, what strikes me is the issue of the ability of small numbers of commercial entities to con limit, to restrict or control what actual human beings are can do. And that's what bothers, that's a thing that bothers me as I hear this. Well, that's, yeah, I don't think, we're not, I, yeah. We're not going to disagree. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, can phrase it, I can phrase it in sort of legalistic terms as a set of exclusive rights, because yeah. that's what the treaty says. But I think what's at stake here, 100%, is power, the power to control your devices, the power to limit freedom of speech online, the power to limit your ability as a consumer to time shift and to retransmit content within your home. So I, I agree. Um, I'll hear them back there. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, I completely second what he said about the EFF and the work it does, um, and, and his comment about using words like restrictive powers and things. But are you aware of any broadcasters um, in whose interests these new powers ostensibly would be, who nevertheless have come out against it? Is there anyone who said, we don't want these powers? In relation to broadcasters, no. I mean, to be, well, to be perfectly frank, the people who are largely pushing for this in the United States are the North American Broadcasting Association. And as I mentioned, there's a number of webcasters. On the webcasting front, there are a number of those. Um, there was a letter that was presented to WIPO by EFF back in 2004, signed by 20 major webcasters and internet companies. Um, people including Mark Cuban, the owner of HDNet, 
um, Elliot Noss from Two Cows, Tim O'Reilly, a number of internet Illuminati, people who have a dog in a fight who would get the benefit of this treaty, who expressly rejected webcasting. They actually felt it would hurt their interests and give, um, give an edge to incumbents over the, their enterprise. But no, broadcasters surprisingly are, are pushing for these rights. And as I said, this is actually kind of surprising in the US context because in the US we've never really granted um, powers <laughs> or rights based on purely investment driven motives. We, for, at least in relation to copyright, we require some modicum of creativity. So this whole concept of what I mentioned, the 1961 Rome Convention, that's alien to the US tradition. But yet broadcasters here are particularly keen to have these types of rights and they want economic rights. They've, they have used the word economic rights. So, yeah. Let's go back down the road. So first off, I want to publicly thank you Beth, for uh, helping us in North Carolina uh, with relation to e-voting. We, uh, we had a case uh, this past December where one of the major uh, electronic voting managers basically said, well, we don't want to comply with the law because it's too expensive. And they actually got a restraining order based on that. And EFF stepped in and helped overturn that. So, you know, EFF has been has helped to make a tangible difference there. Uh, but my, my question with regard to this is, where does it leave the copyright holders? So, for example, if I, you know, create something, you know, some you know, one-minute video clip, and then it's, you know, broadcast, you know, against my wishes, you know, in violation of copyright law, you know, what happens, you know, what's going to go on there, basically? This is the $64,000 question. The, the treaty says that it doesn't have, the, the treaty's preamble says that it's not intended to affect existing copyright rights. Didn't the DMCA say that too? <laughs> well, <laughs> and, uh, leave me inside the DMCA. Um, the, the interesting point to note here is that there's a collective of rights holder organizations, um, the International Photographic, uh, the International Federation of Photographic Industries, which is essentially the international version of the RAA and the NPA that we're familiar with here, they and a number of the rights holders organizations have at the last few WIPO meetings up until recently opposed the treaty and have said that they are concerned about the potential for conflicts because of the overlapping nature of the rights. They've issued public statements on this point. Um, I have to say as the end game draws near, the MPAA in America actually have come out in support of the treaty but have said along with the RAA, that they support the treaty, but they support only a narrow signal piracy-based treaty. Well, hey, EFF and the 40 signatories who signed on to a letter to the USPTO two weeks ago and to WIPO last week also support a signal piracy treaty. This treaty ain't that, so. I think the more, the more interesting hypothetical that I've talked about a lot with Gwen is, is if you have a public domain work, right, work that is not under copyright anymore or something that has been permissively licensed, like a Creative Commons licensed work, what happens when that gets broadcast, right? The broadcaster gets, gets rights over that public domain work, even though under copyright, you would be totally free to use it however you want, right? It'd be basically snatching that, that work back from the public domain and putting it back under a broadcaster's power. With this is like so. Say that someone comes to, with respect to your point about your bullet point about having to clear more rights. Um, say that someone comes to Google Video and says, "We please put our video online." The original content was copyright. Or this happens all the time. Um, but that piece of content has, has been broadcast. So far. They now the copyright holder himself now has to clear the rights. You know so are you're you're saying right? somebody rec say somebody records The Simpsons and wants to put it on. Google video or, record, or broadcast their own thing and record? What's the... Uh, so, yeah, so say, say that, uh, I don't know. So it's fair use of the Simpsons or something. Sitcom yeah. Um, has discovered that they want to be able to put their... Uh -huh. They want to be able to put short clips of their sitcom on Google Yeah, video. the copyright right. owner wants in. I see, in. I see. Yeah. And, 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 but, but they're, you know, that sitcom is broadcast as well. But the people who produce the sitcom want it to be on Google Video. Do, do they have to then, or is it Google's responsibility to then go back to the broadcast? So I think this is one of the interesting questions. I think in a competitive licensing market where yeah. you've got two entities on my reading that could authorize retransmission in that situation, it's the treaty, you know, the treaty's formal language says that copyright's not affected. But as a practical matter, if there's effectively a limited licensing pool for that, copyright holders might find that they don't get as much of the pie as they previously did. I mean, obviously, these things are dealt with in the US at the moment under, under contract law. And 
there'd be another analysis of that. But yeah, it looks like two entities have the same ability to authorize retransmission and extract licensing fees. And that's kind of the same as the DMCA, really, where the creator of the technological protection measure, measure could technically have standing, right? Um, even if they copyrighted or authorized sure. something. Could, could I ask? Could you give us sort of a quick overview of who is showing up in Geneva? You've given us sort of bits and pieces. Yeah. Like, who is being heard? Um, <laughs> As this goes forward. Well, I mean, I, I think the thing I want to point out here is there's been a sea change in the last few months. US industry has shown up in force, and one of the reasons I'm here is because I'd like to see Google as part of that contingent. But let me give you some names Intel, Sony, Panasonic, um, ATT, Verizon, Dell, US, uh, US Telecom, the industry body for the, the telcos. Um, the Computer Communications Industry Association and the Consumer Electronics Association, together with EFF, a number of the major public interest groups, and all the international and US libraries, signed onto a joint statement opposing the current treaty draft. And that was delivered to WIPO last week. Of those, a number of those, as I said, Intel's been there in person, CCIA is there in person, Verizon, at and uh, US Telecom, they are all there in person. And they're going to Geneva because they really are quite worried about how far advanced this treaty is. Let's go back there. Is broadcasting content defined broadly enough to include advertising, or is it just programming that is exclusive of that? Broadcasting, there is no definition of broadcast. Um, that is one of the things that a number of countries would like to see in the current treaty. The current treaty draft instead defines broadcasting, and it talks about transmission of a combination of sounds and audio, or the representation thereof. It doesn't deal with any more granular detail. That's a very good point. Over here. Uh, so assuming the treaty passes in Geneva, uh, as you mentioned, a key fight then is in Washington as the US yeah, implements. And right. the timeline there would probably be late 07, 08, I assume. I was just wondering if the yeah. overall EFF well, have any intelligence on uh, what early signs are of how the US Congress is, is thinking about this. Well, it's kind of cross that bridge when we get there, right? Uh, in the, in the meantime, there are many fights that have to do with um, restrictions on your uh, non-infringing use of broadcast content. Right? So as Gwen mentioned, there's this thing called the broadcast flag, which would basically require all digital television sets to recognize certain copy protection or uh, you know, controls on uh, over-the-air HDTV. Right? So this is, again, having, the TiVo having to go beg permission from the FCC and Hollywood to build their newest devices, right? And that's a live issue right now, uh, in fact, in the, in the, mainly in the Stevens bill in the Senate that has to do with telecom reform, it's been snuck in there as well. Similar bill regarding digital radio um, that's been snuck in there, and also uh, satellite radio. So those are really the live issues right now, and those are the ones that are, I think, gonna be live in Washington over the next foreseeable future. Um, when this comes up, uh, the timetable in yeah, Geneva is pretty, hazy as it is, right? They, they suspended discussions today, Geneva time, in order to have informal discussions between member countries because it's such a divided question at the moment. You basically have the United States opposing the convening of a diplomatic conference and for different reasons, many people and many countries in Latin America and in Asia and on the other side you've got Europe, Eastern Europe and Russia calling for a diplomatic conference. It's it's hung in the balance at the moment, so it's difficult to predict. The other thing I would point out is EFF members have been taking action for some time on the treaty. We've sent, I, I think, over in, in total over the last couple of, last year and a bit, maybe 2,800 of our members have contacted their congressional representatives about this. And our understanding is that actually this is becoming quite a live issue. There's a number of the companies who are now involved in opposing this treaty have also been separately engaging in discussions with uh, congressional committee people and um, and those conversations are ongoing both at the House and the Senate um, committee level. Uh, I'm going to make the point, I suddenly realized I'm confused. Um, if I take a picture of the Mona Lisa, I don't own the Mona Lisa, but I still own the rights to my picture of the Mona Lisa. Right. This was my understanding of what the, this transmission bill was, and you're saying no, you actually, if someone does their, you know, if someone goes to the Louvre and does, the, you know, here's the Mona Lisa, are you saying that they now own the content of their transmission and that they own the Mona Lisa too? 
I mean, this is like what you were saying before, that, you know, the, the people transmitting this right. thing that's also going to YouTube, they own, do they own the transmission or do they own the content? Well, they, it's part so, of the transmission. They need to get the content as a separate entity. Right, so there's a copyright holder, right? So there's a copyright holder who is transmitting the television show, right? Or who, who rather, who's not transmitting it, who's delivering it to who's ever transmitting right. it. They're the copyright holder. They have their, their bundle of copyright right. rights, right? To distribute rights, to copy things like that. Okay? Then there's going to be the whoever the cable caster is, is going to get a separate sort of right, and it's over the recording and use of that work later, right? Okay. So you were, you were say, but if you record it and then reuse it, am I summing so it up this, right? I mean, this is this is the issue in a nutshell. Okay. Basically, what most people who are concerned about this treaty are concerned about is the fact that it goes beyond signal protection. We understand what it means to siphon off a cable or get unauthorized access to a satellite signal. It's not clear to us why you need intellectual property powers or, or rights to protect something that is already protected under copyright. If, EFF and many of the industry groups who I mentioned just now would be happy to see a treaty go forward if it just dealt with signal piracy. This treaty doesn't deal with signal piracy. The issue is it deals, it has these broad rights that apply after you've recorded the content. And that necessarily fudges the distinction between signal protection and content protection. Because you mentioned before a broadcast of something that was part of Creative Commons right. suddenly losing, you know, sometimes right. that, that like is, a picture of the Mona Lisa. Maybe. And many podcasters probably feel the same way. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, similarly. So you kind of touched on it, but what is the argument that the broadcasters are making? Like, what, what technologies are they saying that they would implement if only they had these new powers? Like, what, what are they scared away from doing right now that they could do under these new powers? Well, obviously, I don't speak for the broadcasters, right, so I, I have to make it clear that we are on one side of this particular right. conversation. Um, what, what I can say is repeat some of the things that the broadcasters have said. I think that's a fair way to describe it. Uh, so there was a US Patent and Trademark Office roundtable that took place on September 5. At that, the Senior Associate General Counsel for the North American Broadcasting Association said that the reason they were looking for these rights, looking for this, this treaty, was to protect against internet retransmission of signal piracy. That's what they said. And, the sec and he mentioned in particular a case called the iCrave case. It, it dealt with a Canadian um, Canadian internet company that received um, over received television programming from the US and retransmitted it over the internet. Now, in that particular case, iCrave, the Canadian entity, was shut down by the copyright owners in the content. So, going back to Glenn's question, the copyright owners actually took action in the US court and closed down iCrave. But he mentioned that as sort of the, the case. What they wanted was to have the, the broadcasters in that instance, he said, wanted to have a direct right of action. They didn't want to have to wait till the copyright owners weighed in and protected their content. So that, that's one thing. Um, the second comment he made in May of this year, just before the World Cup kicked off in its, all its glorious force, was that broadcasters wanted to protect sports broadcasting rights. And that certainly has been something that's been said at many meetings over the last eight years that this has been in discussion at WIPO. Um, again, you know, EFF's point would be, well, copyright and theft of services laws deal with that already in the United States and in many other countries of the world. Show us why you still need these new 50-year rights. And more to the point, we've seen things like podcasting, YouTube, and MySpace proliferate, manage to disseminate content on the internet. Without 50-year rights, why, again, do you need 50-year rights? So I, I guess our point is we don't think there is adequate justification, but that's what they've said, so in fairness to the explanation. I think we're winding down on time, um, so maybe one more question, if there is one. Go back so it, it sounds like there are countries out there that do have some notion of broadcast rights. Yeah. Um, first, what are those major, what, what are kind of the big countries that have them, and second, um, you know, are you seeing any of these sort of, the, these hypothetical situations that you're bringing up for what could happen in the United States, do you see similar parallels in countries which already do have these rights or powers? So there are 83 countries, remember, WIPO, had, just to sort of benchmark things, WIPO has 182 member countries, 
83 countries have signed on to the 1961 Rome Convention. And I guess to answer your question about what are the major countries, well, Australia, where I'm from, has broadcasting rights. Um, Europe has rights. Um, and I guess a large amount of the, the push for a sort of an intellectual property rights powers based approach comes is coming from the European countries and the European Commission, which as I said is one of the group of the, the 25 member states and three accession states are speaking as one calling for this diplomatic conference to be convened. So they are very keen to see this go ahead. Um, my understanding is that at least in relation to things like what might be called simulcasting or netcasting, that in some European, not at the community level, but in some European countries, that right exists. It certainly exists in Britain. Um, but there's actually been little on the ground use of that right to date. The, the, the technology is not there, even if the, the right exists on the law books, it's the paper right. So it's, it's difficult to make any assessment. And the other point I would make is the 1961, uh, this treaty would be broader than the 1961 treaty, um, which the US never signed on to. It would be broader because it has ex expanded coverage. It covers broadcasters and cablecasters and potentially netcasters. It has a broader range of rights. And most importantly at all for the technological protection measure provision is novel here. So many of the things we're particularly concerned about haven't been part of that framework yet because TPNs, technological protection measures, have not been part of the broadcasting framework even in the countries that have signed on to Rome. So thanks so much to both of you for coming. Um, Derek has a table of information over there and I think is more than happy to uh, tell you more about EFF and their programs. And they're at EFF.org if you want to find out more about them. And uh, let's give them a round of applause.